All right, we are going to get rolling. Uh, tonight, uh, we won't have a testimony. Um, just to kind of explain the reasoning behind it, there's a couple of these topics that, um, while I would like to have a testimony for every one of these, these sessions, there's two of them in particular that I feel like if we uh, were to ask somebody to come in, uh, like tonight, uh, and share a testimony about their experience with, with wandering and wayward children or, or, or with uh, experiencing life with a prodigal, um, there's the potential with that to put some significant strain on relationships. And so for a lot of families, when they're dealing with the reality of having a child who would be considered more uh, wayward or prodigal in their lifestyle, a lot of those aren't resolved. And so in a desperate attempt to try to keep relationship going, uh, there's some things that are kind of tricky to address. And then in a public setting like this in front of people who may know the person's child, adult child is kind of who we're specifically aiming at with this thing. Uh, there could just be a lot of unnecessary hurt there, and I actually think that it could do a work that would be um, maybe against some gospel influence in uh, someone's life uh, in a damaging way because of what happens to their relationship. So I did talk to uh, several people, and so this is a bit of a unique topic in that the last couple that we've talked about have been things that I personally have gone through and experienced. Uh, this is one where I have not personally been the recipient of the suffering or, or the recipient of the trial, uh, but I would say that there was probably a season of my life where I was probably on the giving end, uh, where as a teenager, as a young man, I, I would have been uh, at least in the category of wayward in, in the way that I lived my life and in the way that I interacted with uh, my parents. But then I also engaged with uh, several people in the church who I do know uh, have struggled in this capacity over uh, several years. Some of them have uh, kids who are now grown, married, and have their own kids. Some of them uh, are dealing with this more from a, a teenage to a young adult perspective. But the struggle is still very much there. And so I asked them for some things to contribute to this specifically about what are things that they have found to be helpful, what are things that they have found that have made their relationship with their child more difficult throughout the process, and what were things that they maybe uh, found were ways that opened doors to keep that relationship at the very least alive uh, so that gospel influence might be able to continue uh, in the future. And so tonight our time structure will play out slightly differently. Um, I mentioned in the past couple of weeks that the hour and 15 minutes that we have each week, we can't completely cover all of these topics. And, and uh, each of these could be a class in and of themselves that would take the entirety of our six weeks. Two things on that. Um, one, if you're at a place where you are struggling with anything we've covered so far, and, and so whether that be chronic pain, whether that just be uh, long-term suffering in some capacity that maybe we won't even cover, maybe that's infertility like we talked about last week, or any of the topics yet to come, um, and, and you're just kind of stuck and you don't really know where to go next, I, I don't want to pretend that you're leaving this room with all of the answers and now you can just walk in freedom and joy and happiness for all of eternity. Uh, rather, my hope was that this class opens the door a bit for you in your thinking so that you can actually see that maybe there is hope. You probably will not experience it in fullness, but if you can actually see that it's there, maybe you're able to take some steps towards some healing that's actually really helpful and necessary as we process through living in a world that's broken by sin and what God's Word actually has to say about it. Uh, with that, uh, if you've been around here for a while, you know this, and uh, maybe you've been around and just we don't advertise it a lot because, truth be told, we have a hard time keeping up with the demand. Uh, but we offer biblical counseling here at Redemption Hill. The biblical counseling ministry is one of our uh, very significant ministries. It's kind of what we would consider kind of one of our core three things that we do. So that'd be the Sunday gathering. That'd be gathering together in our gospel community groups. And biblical counseling is kind of like our primary three things that we do as a church. Uh, we do that for no cost at all. And so whether you're a member here, whether you don't attend here on Sundays, Whatever it looks like, we offer that for free, and we help people and walk with people uh, in, in applying biblical truth and finding hope through God's Word and how to deal with these subjects. And so I think for a lot of us, we're not at the spot where we're feeling comfortable to 
even bring this up at our GC, our gospel community group. Certainly not going to talk to people in a classroom setting like this about it, but, but to get in an, a, a closed space with somebody who loves you, with somebody who is not doing this for the purpose of making monetary or financial gain for themselves in any capacity, uh, and who has gone through extensive training to learn how to minister God's word to people who are hurting, uh, is just a tremendous opportunity that uh, I think would be uh, a really good oppor- uh, thing for you to take advantage of. Um, Beyond that, sorry, the screen is doing something weird. I'm going to turn it off before it does something I really dislike. There we go. Um, In addition to that, if you're at a spot where you're like, you know what, I think I'm doing well. Um, I don't think I need to talk to anybody, or maybe I'm not quite ready to talk to anybody. Uh, All of these topics we have extensive resources for here at Redemption Hill. And so, uh, whether that be books or or different sermon series or or just, we have a lot of different things like that. And if you have one of them that you're like, I would really like to be able to spend some time on that thing on my own so that I could learn and grow, come and talk to me, email me. My business cards are all over downstairs. You can get a hold of me, and I would be happy to get you guys resources or even just uh, talk to me on the way out of class uh, any of these nights, and I'd be happy to connect you with... um, at least the right direction to go as you're looking for maybe different things that you could be reading or using to help you through this process. Uh, with that, I'm going to pray, and we will get rolling. <sighs> Father God, the, the one who has always loved us and known us, the one who once and for all frees us, from slavery and bondage to sin, from hopelessness and suffering and pain. You know the condition of every soul, of each one that you've created and made. And and, and tonight, God, as we go into this time of talking about the difficult reality of, of being a parent who has a child that, that has wandered away, being a parent uh, who as a child has rejected the truth of your word, that has rejected the truth of the gospel, and has decided instead to walk in worldly rebellion. God, we ask that you be moving. God, we know that there is no one that is so far gone that you cannot intervene into their story. That there is no one who is yours that you have chosen from before the beginning of time and creation that will not be saved. And so, God, we, we just a- are asking you to do a work. We're asking that you would do a work of giving us wisdom to know when to engage, to know when to speak up, and to know when it's time to just love. God, I'm asking that you would give me wisdom now as I approach a topic that I have not personally experienced, but have had the opportunity to walk with some people through, God, that you would give me the right words to say. God, that if there's anything that I've put together in my preparation for tonight that would be unhelpful for somebody who's sitting in this room, that you would uh, give me the, the guidance and wisdom of not saying it. And in all of these things, we ask that, that you would be glorified and that we would grow to be looking uh, more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Once again, tonight we start off with Genesis 18.25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And, and now we're starting to deal with some territory where I, I feel like when it comes to myself and my own body and my own suffering, I, I can at least to some extent, get to the place where I can say, you know what, yes, this, this is suffering that impacts me, and so I can deal with this. I, I can see that God is good to me in this. I can see God's rightness in this, even though I don't understand it. And, and in something like we talked about last week with infertility, again, it, it's incredibly difficult And there's a sense of grief and loss that's real and significant attached to it. But 
But I can start to ask the question, well, what might God be doing by making me wait? What might God be doing by saying no to me about this thing? And I could logic myself into the place of saying, you know what? Maybe God is protecting me from something by not letting me have a child. I I could think my way to the place of saying, maybe God is giving me the grace of of not having a child that wouldn't come to know him. But when it comes to the wandering and wayward, when it comes to the prodigal, what we're talking about now is different. Because this isn't hypothetical. This isn't the waiting anymore. This is something that has taken place. This is, this is a dream that God fulfilled in the lives of, of two people and parents by giving them a child who they raised, who they loved, who they care for, and who they nourish, who, who they completely rearranged their life around so that that child could grow and learn and become a part of society so that their hopes might be seen that this would be a child who loves Jesus. And at some point along the way, things went off the rails, and they don't know why. But their child, the one that they love and care for, the one that they would die for, has decided that they want nothing to do with God and in many cases want nothing to do with the parents who have loved them and known them. And when that's your circumstance, to be able to say, well, not the judge of all the earth, do what's right, it's different. Because you start to question things like this. Well, God, why did you give me a child at all if they won't love you? Why would you give me a child to love and to care for and to steward in your plan if their future might be hell? That's a really significant and difficult question. And so to wrestle through the question of, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? in that season, in that place. It's just different. Because what you start to encounter is what potentially is one of the the most difficult questions in all of Scripture and in all of creation, which is this. Why is it that some are saved and some are not? And we can't avoid that reality in Scripture. The Bible is incredibly clear that there are those who will know Christ as their Savior and will spend eternity with Him in heaven. And that there are those who won't. And so, to walk in this thing, there's there's a couple of things that I think we need to lay as groundwork with this reality of, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? And that is that we are starting from a base, a base level of this, this belief. All of us are prodigals. All of us are prodigals. <coughs> Psalm 51.5, King David says, I was born in sin, conceived in sin. At the moment of conception, I was sin. And to be sin means that your future, your destiny, is separation from a holy God forever. And this is not a class to delve into the depths of theology on God's sovereignty or or, or on how salvation takes place or for whom salvation takes place. We've got classes for that, but we have to wrestle through the question of, is God still good if there are those who will not be united with him in heaven forever? And I think you know that my answer to this question is yes. And I think part of the way that we see that the answer to this question is yes is by the reality that all of these other forms of suffering do in fact exist and God's faithfulness endures through all of them. 
through the fact that in a world of people who are all born as prodigals, that there are any who will receive grace and be saved at all. We, we catch a glimpse and a taste of his goodness in ways that we don't quite always understand. But we have to wrestle with this truth that is not a question as much as a statement, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? And so I ask you again tonight, as we have each week before, to re rehearse Genesis 18.25 with me. Uh, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? And so together we'll say it. Uh, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? As we get into this topic, I think there's a couple of categories that we need to, to look at and understand when it comes to the prodigal versus the wayward or, or the wandering. Because I think we tend to lump all of these ideas and, and these definitions together, but, but I actually don't believe that they are completely the same thing. The wandering and the wayward would be maybe more classified, I think, as somebody who's going through a season of rebellion... Uh, that rebellion may include an unwillingness to bend the knee to a heavenly father, so a rejection of biblical truth and faith. But this person may not necessarily be a person who's going and living a lifestyle that we would consider then <laughs> destructive. They may be a believer, we don't know, by their action and their words in that season, we may not be able to affirm that they are a believer, but they have not burned everything to the ground. We, we need to have categories like this because the reality is, is that each of us at different seasons of our lives and even at different seasons of our walk with Christ, we may look more like a wanderer. We may look more like somebody who, who is heading in a wayward direction in a season of sinful rebellion, struggle with truth, questioning God. But this person is not definitively, necessarily, unsaved. A prodigal, on the other hand, is marked by the abandonment of, of, of the family faith, yes, a complete rejection of truth, what the Bible says about who God is and what he's done for us, by an abandonment of relationships and a <clears throat> abandonment of even themselves to a lifestyle that is, that is reckless and destructive in nature. A prodigal engages in life in such a way that everything in their wake is destroyed. And they're not the same thing. They are real trials. And they actually boil down to two very simple ideas. Potentially, what we're looking at is that two people whom we deeply love, our child and our Savior, are separated from each other. That is the baseline question that we're looking at when it comes to the wayward, the wanderer, or the prodigal. That based on their lifestyle, at the very least, we are not able to affirm today that we believe that they know Jesus. We don't know the heart, but at the very least, we can't affirm it. And at worst, they are a person who has openly, blatantly, and destructively rejected the truth of God's word with intent and purpose. And no matter which one it is, it breaks our hearts. See, if you've grown up in the church, if you've been around for a while, there's, there's these kind of like urban legends that exist within church culture. Uh, work hard and you'll get rewarded. Or this one. 
train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's scripture. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And when I say urban legend, you might be like, how in the world are you comparing Scripture to myth or or to something that may not be real? And here's why. Because I think that there's a lot of times where, where the church where people in the church take a passage like Proverbs 22, 6, and they apply it to their lives as a promise. And so over and over, people in the church hear Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it, preached to them and taught to them as though this is a promise and a guarantee that if you follow this methodology, if you do these things, this will be your result. Unfortunately, when somebody takes a passage like Proverbs 22.6, which is incredible wisdom, and and we're going to talk about this because we're not saying we abandon this by any stretch of the imagination, but when we take a passage like that, outside of the context of what type of literature it is, And outside of the context of the rest of Scripture, we do a ton of damage. We do a ton of damage. See, the the book of Proverbs is is full of language like this. It's it's wisdom literature. It's literature that was written by a father to his young adult child. And he's saying, these are things to live by. These are guidelines for life. These are practices of wisdom that will honor God. And as a general rule, not every case, but as a general rule, when a person does these things, it does go well for them. But we have the flip side of the coin given to us in Ecclesiastes, which talks about life as as hevel. It's a Hebrew word for, for smoke or vapor. This thing that's there and you can see it, but as you try to grasp it, as you try to hold on to it, it it sneaks through your fingers and it seems completely unobtainable. That it's temporary and that while you can see it now, as you wave your hand through it, it will disappear. That life is vapor and, and no matter who you are, these are kind of your three categories that Ecclesiastes gives you, no matter who you are, time keeps passing and we will be forgotten. No matter how significant you were, no matter how beloved by your family, no matter how much money you've made, there will come a point in time where nobody remembers your name. Where no matter who you are, how strong you are, how healthy you are, how fit you are, how much money you have, how many good doctors you go to, everybody will die. And... Lastly, that often good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. And we're left with this tension that says Proverbs is is telling me to live this way, but Ecclesiastes is saying you might live this way and it may work well for you or it may not. But regardless, these things are your fate. These will be the outcome of every life in existence. And so when we take something like Proverbs, which is wisdom literature, it is guidelines for life, not steadfast rules of guarantee for life, and we start to cling to it as a promise, it it kind of only leaves one of two options for, for where we go from there. Option one, we follow the rules really, really well. We, we, we did the step-by-step instruction. Our methodology was perfect. And things went exactly how we hoped that they would go. I followed, I followed it to the letter. Raise up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. 
And so we did Bible study every day. We never missed a wana. We went to church every Sunday. They never missed youth group. They memorized all of the verses. We did character cards in the morning. Everything in our lives was based around helping this child to see the goodness of God. And they're saved. And they love God. And, and now they have a family. And they're raising that family to love God. And we think to ourselves, I followed the plan. I did what Scripture said. A, get married, have a good spouse, check. B, have children, check. C, raise your children up so that they might follow after Jesus, check. I did all of the things. And then you find yourself stuck in a sense of, of foolish pride. That says, look how hard I've worked and look how good my results have been. Foolish pride that's, that's rooted in what we believe to be the results of our hard work and our parenting methodology. And so this is the thing that you start to see happening when, when suddenly you have the homeschool versus public school debate and you have people taking sides and picking up their camp and grabbing their shield and their sword and, and going to war over what they believe to be the right way to parent your kids and that if you don't do it this way, clearly you couldn't love your kids and you obviously couldn't love God. Don't you see how my kids turned out? My methodology is proven. We'll get into that in a minute. Option two is we followed the rules. We did everything that Scripture said to do. We did the memory verses. We did the devotions. We went to church. They went to youth group. But things didn't go how we had hoped and dreamed. And even after the, the, the kid, your son, your daughter, was bathed in truth from birth into their teen years, they walk away. And now we look at what happened we look at this promise that we've been told is there. If I do the right thing, it will turn out the right way. And we're left with the question, what did I mess up? How did I fail so badly that, that even though I followed the prescribed method, my child doesn't love Jesus, and in fact, they don't want anything to do with me either. And so we, we find ourselves spiraling in needless guilt and, and, and misplaced shame because we worked really hard to raise our kids for God and we feel like we've failed. And neither one of those are a good option. Be, because the reality of this thing is, is that it doesn't matter at the end of the day if I did everything right or if I did everything wrong, neither one of those two things is going to save the soul of my child. When, when we go to this place of saying, I'm going to claim a promise that was never made, by the way. I'm going to claim this promise for myself. This is now going to be my lifestyle. This is going to be everything that I am and everything that I know we are now starting to believe that somehow parenting is done in works-based righteousness. I have worked hard enough, and now I have gotten this good, wonderful result. Or I have failed in my hard work, and I'm being punished because of my failing. There's no hope here. There is no grace here. There is no gospel here. It's all based on merit. And that flies in the face of everything that we see throughout Scripture. And what I'm not saying is that you just abandon all work. What I'm not saying is that you just say, well, since it doesn't matter, I'm just going to do whatever I want and let the wind take them where it will. No, 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 no. We'll get into why that doesn't work, but, but hold on to this. We are called to one thing in life, ultimately. Only one. There's actually not that many things that God says, be this. Here's the one. Be faithful. Be faithful. <coughs> so how does this play out? See, for the parent who has longed for this child, who has dreamed of, of, of being able to have this family who's going to love and serve Jesus, and, and this, is, this is just real, when, when children enter the picture, 
they are able to grip and squeeze your heart in ways that you never expected. This is something that, uh, after last week, um, talking about infertility is certainly um, sobering and um, Zoe's kind of brought this new revelation to my life. Uh, if you don't know, Zoe's the little girl that we adopted just over a year ago. Um, I was even telling my mom this earlier this week that, that I realized a couple of times now that I am actually physically willing and able to kill somebody else for the right thing. The day after we brought Zoe home, it turned out we brought her home with pneumonia. Surprise. Um, And I knew nothing about parenting, changing diapers, holding a baby, transporting a baby, going anywhere with a baby. But I had to bring her to urgent care. And they took her from me. And I had had her for less than 24 hours. And um, they brought her screaming out of the room where they said, you're not allowed to come with. We're taking your baby and we need to go run these tests to figure out what's wrong with her. And they brought her back just screaming. Uh, And I was not used to crying yet, to be fair. But then they explained to me that they went and put her in this weird glass tube thing so that she couldn't move so they could take x-rays of her. And it was in the moment when I realized that they had put my daughter into a tube and then also that she was now this upset about what they had done to her and she was sick and I had no clue what I was doing that I was like ready to fight and I didn't know why. And then again, as we brought her in for her, her vaccinations, You can email me about that later if you want. Um, And we watched them give her shots in her chubby little thighs. And the doctor left. Like, the doctor knows this is a terrible thing to do to another person. So she's like, see ya. I don't want to be associated with pain. And this nurse comes in, and this is her job. Like, she just stabs babies. That's literally what she does. And she held her down, and she said the words, these are perfect shot-giving thighs. And then proceeded to stab my child multiple times. I remembered in that moment, I am physically capable of killing another human. And I am fine going to prison for the rest of my life for it. (laughs) This is what kids do for you. To last night, because she had the sniffles and wasn't sleeping great, I I just didn't sleep. Because I was like, what if she has a bad reaction to Tylenol? I'm already not sleeping through the night and she can basically walk. Like, that's her one activity. She's 18 months old. Like, children grip and squeeze your heart in ways that we do not expect. And we have dreams and we have desires for how our kids will turn out, for, for what they'll be like, for how their life should look when they get older. We desire that they'll grow up, that they'll, they'll find a good job, that they'll get married to a good spouse, that they'll have kids, that they'll serve Jesus together. But the reality is this, and this is from Paul Tripp or somebody smarter than me. Kids make terrible gods. They make terrible gods. Because in your best case scenario, where your kids do everything that you've ever hoped that they would do, where they love Jesus, where they pursued after Jesus, where they're raising a family to love Jesus, everything is going right, they're still a sinner they will still fail you. And if you have set something or someone up in the place of being a God in your life who can and will fail you as a guarantee, you're setting yourself up for misery, for absolute misery. Growing up, my parents would joke around about the idea that I was either going to be a pastor or a prisoner. There wasn't a lot of other option for me. And... Best case scenario, seemingly, I ended up being a pastor. But that does not mean that they didn't receive significant heartbreak from me over decisions that I made over and over and over throughout my young adult life. It doesn't mean that they weren't devastated inside to see the very angry man that I was becoming. If I had been their hope, and you can ask them, I certainly wasn't. But if I had been their hope, their world would have been in shambles. And and the same is true for any person who you put your hope into that isn't Jesus. 
But kids make terrible, terrible gods. And sometimes they don't just rebel a little bit or, or, or go off the path for a while or have a season of rebellion and anger. Sometimes they take things to an extreme where they reject everything about our hopes and our plans for their life. They reject our Savior, who, who is the most important relationship we have. They reject our family and our morals and everything that we have ever stood for. They reject our work ethic. They reject the way that we view people. They reject the way that we view all of life and creation. They reject us. And then this, this person who we've potentially set up as an idol in our lives and in our hearts has left us in this place of feeling significant hurt and betrayal and fear. And we have fear about, about a lot of things. We have fear about where are they going to sleep tonight? Where are they going to be tomorrow morning? Are they going to be alive tomorrow or not? We have fear about what are people going to think about me when people see what's happened with my child the child that I raised, the child that was always at church with me? What, what are people going to think about me when they see what my kid is doing on social media? What are people going to ask me about when, when they catch wind that my kid was at the bar trashed again last night and they're not at church again this morning? What are people going to think about me when... <coughs> My child starts trying to tell people that the way that I raised them to love Jesus was in fact abuse. And where they turn themselves into a victim to make themselves seem more righteous. What are people going to think about me when I'm slandered? And we feel betrayal. The person who literally is alive today only because we decided to take care of them because we decided to be willing to change disgusting diapers and let them puke through our beards and scream in our faces at all hours, no matter what, has decided that we are not worth their time to speak to. We experience disappointment as a dream that we had has been crushed in front of us. And then if we're really honest we might start to look at the way we actually interacted with them over the 18 years of life or whatever it's been to that point in time and realize, oh no, I sinned a lot. I, I sinned against them in significant ways and, and I am feeling the weight of guilt because I realize now that, yes, I have a wayward child, but I was also a wayward father. And we feel shame. We have to understand this. Whether you have kids who are in this place of <coughs> waywardness or rebellion, or whether you're at the place where you're like, I'm, I'm single, I'm not even on the family horizon yet. We have to understand this. To anything in life, there is no such thing as a foolproof methodology for success. It does not exist. Whether that be in your pursuit of a relationship, in your pursuit of marriage, in your pursuit and desire to have children, whatever it may be, there is no such thing as a foolproof, guaranteed method of success if we follow a certain set of rules or guidelines. Do not fall into the trap of foolish pride or broken despair that comes from thinking if you work and try hard enough, you will find success. I was in youth ministry for about 12 years, and in that time, I had, I don't even know how many students, probably um, at least over a thousand. Um, I had private Christian school kids. I had homeschool kids. I had public school kids. I had Catholic school kids. And you name it, they went through my youth ministries. And 
this is maybe just an aside, but I think it's important. There's not a speck of difference between any of them. There's not a speck of difference between any of them. What I mean by that is this. I had public school students who love Jesus and were incredibly faithful who are now in the mission field or serving as pastors. And I had public school students who have now decided to sell their bodies on the internet and, and are now deeply involved in addiction and pain. And I had homeschool kids that did the same and private school kids that did the same, and Christian school kids that did the same. It's grace. And over and over and over again, it doesn't matter which church it is, which people group it is, there are these thoughts and debates on this is the only faithful way to raise a child. And if you are missing the reality that the only reason a child that you have or a child that you know happens to love Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord, if you miss that that is grace alone, you've missed everything. You've missed everything. There are none of us that in our foolish pride of thinking, look at how I followed all of the rules and look at how well-mannered and behaved my children are. Look at how I follow the rules and how they love Jesus now. Look at how I follow the rules and, and now they are doing all of the things that I desired for them to do. We cannot let ourselves get to the place where we would then take the credit for ourselves in our efforts, in our methodology, and how we did this form of schooling and it was superior, how we did this thing in the morning for Bible study and it was better, how we always made sure to do daddy-daughter date nights or whatever, whatever you want to do. It's grace. The glory does not belong to you. The glory belongs to the king. And outside of his intervening into your child's story, they were bound for hell and you had nothing to do with their salvation. Do not take the credit for yourself. The glory belongs to God. In foolish pride, we might be tempted to point people towards our system rather than our Savior. In foolish pride, we might be tempted to judge others who have struggled in this area thinking and saying things to them that we're just so wise and so helpful when we say, well, you know, if you had just done this, they probably would have turned out differently. <coughs> you know, homeschool, man, those kids don't get exposed to enough in the world, and so when they get done, they just go nuts unless the grace of God public school. You can't protect them from anything. How can you ever expect them to desire to follow after Jesus because of the grace of God? And when we think that we are walking in success and dwelling in this place of foolish pride, we need to remember and carry this weight with us. It is by grace alone, always. And none of us are ever so put together or so successful that we are not just one phone call away from our lives being shattered. That's all it takes. It's one call where I've seen parent after parent after parent who believed that their child was the second coming and ended up finding out that their child was just really good at playing games and didn't love Jesus at all, and had finally gotten caught in it. We do not have our lives so well put together because we follow the rules so well that we are untouchable. We live a fragile life. Dave Harvey, um, pastor in the Sojourn Network, um, talked about this in reference to when we look at our situation and then we look at other people's situations and we might find ourselves in that judgmental place of saying, well, look what I did and how good it turned out for me and, well, 
If they had just been a little more like me, things could have been better. Things could have been different. He says this, he says, comparison creates a callous culture where suspicion trumps compassion. Hear that, where suspicion trumps compassion. Where you might look at a person who's suffering and instead of saying, oh my goodness, my brother or my sister is broken and I need to weep with those who weep. Instead, you start to wonder, well, where did they mess up? where speculation replaces intercession. So I'm going to sit and dwell about and think about all of the ways that they've probably failed and how I could have done it better rather than going to a holy God who knows them, made them, and knows their situation in a way that you probably never, ever will and praying for them. And judgment supplants long-suffering. Well, they've been suffering for a long time but they should just be able to get over it. Well, I know that their, their kid was broken, but I didn't realize how broken they were to be this jacked up about it for so long. Why can't they just move forward? Don't they just know that God is good? Long-suffering is not just referring to the way that we endure trials. It's referring to the way that we will endure trials together. For some... He says, all Christians are called to suffer. For some, the pain comes through a prodigal. That's foolish pride. The other place where we might find ourselves if things did not go well for us as we tried to claim this promise that was never made is broken despair. Broken despair. Remember, 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 God never promised us children, let alone children who will honor God or honor you. God never promised us children, and he never promised us children who will honor him or honor us in any capacity. In fact, what we see all the time throughout Scripture, just, just go read the, the Old Testament, and it will take you... I don't know, until like chapter 4 to see the first rebellion take place. I'm not talking about Adam and Eve's rebellion. Technically, you could just go to chapter 3 and you get to see the first rebellion in Scripture where two children decided to rebel against their father. But where one set of human parents had a child who rebelled and failed them. You go to like Genesis chapter 4 and you see the story of Cain and Abel. It doesn't take long. And you trace it throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Genesis 1 through 50 is effectively this. It's the story of God's mercy and grace on people who never deserved it, the ways that they're going to mess up, and the ways that their children will see them mess up and then mess up themselves. That's effectively the first 50 chapters of the Bible. We have never received the promise that that we will have children who, who love us or honor God. In fact, what we've seen from the beginning is that children tend to disappoint their parents at different times and in different ways. And if you look at your life, like just, just honestly, you were there. You were there. Whether you were a teenager or a child who rebelled in outward ways, or whether you were the child who pretended to be incredibly compliant, but on the inside was rebelling the entire time. We have all been there. <coughs> We're not immune. Next, if you're in the position where, where you've worked hard to get your family to love God, and yet there are one or more in your family who have chosen to rebel against that, we have to remember this. We are called to be faithful. We're going back to this idea. The one thing that we're actually called to do in, in our lives effectively is be faithful and own where we failed. And I think what happens a lot of times is, is we get stuck in this phase of I've been hurt and betrayed 
And then we kind of get into the cycle of, and I messed everything up, and now life is despair, and it cannot possibly get better. And that's just not true. That's just not true. Even in the worst case scenario, if you were there and you even tried, you have not messed everything up. But what we do have to do is honestly reflect on our lives and reflect on the situation and say, is it possible that I have sinned in this thing? Not in a way that would give me the end result of a rebellious child. No, no, no. We're going to get to why that doesn't happen. But have I sinned against God? Have I, have I sinned against my child in a way that I need to take seriously and repent of? We have to ask that question, but we can't stay there. We have to say, I need to own my sin, confess my sin, seek forgiveness for my sin, and move forward in faithfulness under a promise that actually does exist, which is you have been forgiven by Christ at the cross, no matter how significant your failing or sin. We're called to continue to be faithful. And what I mean by that is this, a godly home is in fact important. And we're given God's word, we are given the Holy Spirit, and we are given the church, the body of Christ, for a very particular purpose to help us, to encourage us, and to spur us on towards faithfulness, including in the way that we run our home. And I think the temptation for a parent, particularly if it's one of their earlier children that they had, that if they see that child go wayward or become a prodigal in some capacity, that they'll just say, well, then forget it, because I did all of the work and none of it did anything. It didn't make a difference. Look what happened. No, no, no. Your child's rebellion does not give license to abandon what is directed to us by a Heavenly Father, even if we're sad about the results. A godly home is important, and we are called to strive forward in faithfulness with it. Next, an important truth for the person who um, feels as though they have been failed or betrayed by a prodigal. Every person, including our children, are responsible for their own actions and choices. Every person, including our children, the ones that we want to protect and defend and refuse to hear anybody say anything bad about them, we are responsible for our own actions and choices. And for a parent, this can be incredibly difficult because parents tend to live vicariously through their children's successes and failures. And so if their child is the all-star on Kingsford basketball team, they are going to live through the fact that look at how good and impressive and amazing my son or my daughter is. that they need to have a bumper sticker on their car for every year that their kid happens to make the honor roll. That the only thing that anybody ever seems to hear them talk about is how amazing their kid is. And people will hear them talk about how amazing their child is, but have never heard them say how amazing God is. But they don't just live vicariously through their child's successes. They live vicariously through their child's failures. And so when your child fails, it is directly an assault against my person. Failure in my child is an assault against who I am. My reputation is now tarnished because of them. My value and worth is in question because... Can't I even teach them how to drive the speed limit? And you don't have to go very far until this starts being a thing. Like, I, I have thoughts about this on Sunday mornings. When we put Zoe in the nursery, I think to myself, I really hope she behaves. Because if not, people are going to think, wow, can't Pastor Josh even train up an 18-month-old to be good? No. No, I can't. She, she gets grumpy all the time. There's a reason my wife's not here tonight. But we, we start to live vicariously through them and start to think that everything in their behavior somehow is a direct reflection of, of us. And, and it's just not. They're responsible for their own actions. And it gets worse as we get older. If we can't control a toddler, how can we expect that we're going to be able to control a fourth grader? 
or an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old and that you have parents who are still trying to intervene into and control the lives of their grown adult children into their 50s. Ezekiel chapter 18 is very pointed about this, verses 20 and 21. It says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Each person is responsible for what is theirs. And if my father sinned, it has no holding on my life or my soul. Wow, this has gone by very quickly. We're going to start moving a little bit faster. Um, next, prodigals and wanderers often uh, come from the same family. And, and so this is where you start to see proof in the pudding that methodology actually does not make that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things outside of grace and the gospel. Again, we go back to Cain and Abel as our examples. We see that, that Abel is walking in a way where he desires to honor God, where he desires to make sacrifices in the way that he should, where his brother, raised by the same parents in the same time, in the same home, with the same rules, and everything else, rebels. We need to remember, as parents, we do have a lot of influence in the lives of our children, but we have no power in any capacity to change their life or change their heart. Something I remind my counselees of all the time and, and remind myself of on a regular basis is this very important sentence. If you take nothing away tonight, take this. I am not the Holy Spirit. I am not the Holy Spirit, which means I am never, ever, ever the agent of change in anyone's heart for any reason. That's God and God alone. And if we try to claim that power for ourselves, we are trying to usurp a creator It is not for us to change the lives or hearts of our children. To see that this is true, we look at uh, Second Kings. If you just follow through the account of the kings that are there, we're going to run through this quickly. I stole it from Brad Bigney, cards on the table. Uh, we see the, the, the lifespan of the different kings for the nation of Judah and Israel. We start off with Jehoshaphat, who was a godly king who ruled for 25 years. But his son, Jehoram, was a wicked king who ruled for eight years. And so we see that there was a godly man who was a godly king and who is honored in Scripture, who has a son who wants nothing to do with God or righteousness in any capacity. And his son, um, Ahaziah, was also a wicked king who ruled for just one year. So we see that there was one good king, then two wicked kings. But his son, the son of Ahaziah, Joash, was a godly man who ruled for 42 years. And his son, Amaziah, was a godly man who ruled for 29 years. And his son, Uzziah, was a godly man who ruled for 52. And his son, Jotham, was a godly man who ruled for 16. And so we see, oh, wait, things are looking good. Until he has a son named Ahaz, who's an incredibly wicked king who ruled for 16 years. And his son, Hezekiah loved God and, and lived faithfully for 29, but, but his son Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings that we see throughout the entirety of the Old Testament for the nation of Israel, who reigned for 55 years. And his son Amon was, was wicked and ruled for two, but his son, one of the most righteous kings that we see throughout the Old Testament, Josiah, was faithful and godly and ruled as king for 31 years. And so it seems that there are times when a godly king has a godly son. And there are times when a godly king has a wicked son. And, and there are times where a wicked king has a wicked son, but there are times when a wicked king has a godly son. Who is it that determines whether or not they will be godly? God. It is by grace alone. 
We already said at the beginning tonight, everyone is born as a prodigal. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. This is God speaking. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The most perfect father ever is making a statement that says, the children that I have raised up, the children I have nourished from their birth, from creation itself, have rebelled against a holy God who made them. We are born as prodigals. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Two final things and we'll be done. As I was talking to different parents who, ha- who have walked through um, the long season of suffering with a prodigal child, um, I kind of compiled a list of things that they, they found most practical and helpful for them and how they engaged with their child on a daily, weekly, and yearly basis. Because for some of these parents, this was their state of existence for 20 or 30 years. Um, some of them it's a little bit newer and a little fresher, but the first one is this. We've already mentioned it earlier. Own what's yours. One of the most gospel um, directing and helpful things that you could possibly do if you have a wayward child is to be willing to look at your own life, to look at your relationship, and to say, you know what, I am not perfect, and I need to be willing to humble myself, see where I've sinned, own my sin, confess my sin, and seek their forgiveness, even if they never do the same for me. I need to own what's mine. And that they might actually see, maybe for the first time in their entire life of knowing you, God is doing a changing work. And that changing work may just start with him even leading you into the humility to be willing to ask for their forgiveness. Because here's the deal, a lot of parents have never ever asked for their children's forgiveness about anything. Next, love them as they are, not how you wish they were. Love them as they are, not what your ideal situation for them might be. You see, I think for a lot of parents, they just cannot get their heads wrapped around the fact that their child isn't following after God. And so they only love them in the capacity that they think, well, they're just going to come out of this. They're just going to, the light's going to go on and they're going to remember how great I've been. And so I, I still love them, but but only when they meet my criteria for what it's supposed to look like. No, because that's not how God loves us. Malachi 3.6 is a verse that my dad pounded into my head my entire life growing up, and it says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God is saying, I haven't changed. You have. I will never change. I will always keep my promises even though you are a promise breaker. He loves us as we are. He chose us as we are. He died for us knowing exactly who we would be. And for you as a parent, you're called to love your children as they are, not what you wish they were. Next, and this seems simple, but it's it's huge. Encourage them in anything that you can possibly find that is positive or praiseworthy. And so if you are the person who has a child who is walking in wayward rebellion, do they have a job? Do they go to work? Do they pay their bills? Do they, do they go to school? You know, do, do they have a, a spouse who they love and take care of? Like, if you can find something actually see it, be thankful for it yourself, and encourage it in them. It will do so much more for your relationship and potentially giving you real gospel opportunity over the long haul than you understand. Next, live in God's Word. Live in God's Word. Even if it is only to the capacity of, I am going to memorize one verse And it's Genesis 18, 25, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? 
Be a person who is willing to soak in Scripture so much so that you get to the place where, where your natural bent in response when trial does show up is truth. Where, where when, when the bottle is squeezed, the thing that will come out of it is, is what's inside. And that can either be bitterness, resentment, pain, or the love of God given to us through his revealed self in his word. Live in his word. Never stop going to God in prayer. So never allow yourself to get to the place where you would say, you know what, I have prayed for them for years and there's been no change. I just don't even know if it's worth it anymore. God must be saying no to my prayer. Now keep praying. Isaiah 62 is one of my favorite passages when it comes to going before a holy God. Isaiah 62 says this, it says, You who put the Lord in remembrance... Take no rest. So you who go to the Lord in prayer, you who remember who he is and what he's done, take no rest and give him no rest until he restores Zion and Jerusalem is made new again. It's saying, don't stop going. Because while we do have this example from the New Testament where Paul prays to God three times to have a thorn in his flesh removed and God does tell him no because my strength is made perfect in your weakness and you will learn and grow and understand that my grace is sufficient for you. God may have spoken to him in a very particular and specific way. But... Unless by some miraculous act of God you hear him say to you, no, you keep praying. And if that no isn't scripture being quoted to you in some capacity, then you should really question where it's coming from. God's not giving us new revelation, God confirms his word. So we take no rest and we give him no rest as we go before him and plead for mercy. Next, don't isolate or hide. Don't isolate or hide. Find a church where where you are able to be in community, where people can be praying with you, to have people that you know are not just leaving you to pray in that Isaiah 62 capacity by yourself, but are actively walking in it with you is a gift. It's a gift. And I believe that as we pray and as we have others praying with us, we do see God move. We do. He calls us to to go before him. He calls us to ask him for help. And we should. Stay in community and keep serving. Don't allow yourself to get to the place where you are so focused here that you're unable to focus out. And uh, we have a minute and 30 seconds. Uh, Dealing with shame. Dealing with shame. Um, Your identity cannot be found in your kids. Your identity cannot be found in your kids. Your identity cannot be found in their success. Your identity cannot be found in their failure. If it is, it will crush you. To walk in in freedom from guilt and shame, we have to walk in our identity in Christ. That's the only way. It's the only way we see that Christ bore our shame. Um, We don't have time to read it, but go to Hebrews 12, 2. He bore our shame. Romans 5, 5 says that the gospel removes the shackles of sinful disgrace from our lives. Romans 10, 11 says that everyone who believes in Christ will not be put to shame. Your reputation can be slandered, but your identity is secure if you're in Christ. We do not walk in shame, we walk in freedom and hope. And biblical community is unbelievably crucial. The church should be a place where friends bear grief together, withhold judgment, and extend grace 
where we comfort one another with the comforts with which we've been comforted, where we protect confidentiality, and where we meet shame with gospel hope. And lastly, I'll just finish off with this quote from uh, Dave Harvey that I found really helpful. Uh, For the person who's seeking to love somebody who's struggling with this, who's suffering in this capacity where their child has walked away, when you hear the words wayward or rebellious or prodigal tumble from a parent's lips, hear grief. Hear grief and grieve with them. Don't be a fixer. Entrust any discovery of culpability to God and time. That's not your immediate priority. The more we comprehend grace, the more our care moves from identifying their sin or judging them in it to sympathizing with their suffering. Because it's real. Um, Again, if you're there, if this is something you've been walking in, I would encourage you to reach out. Reach out to the church office. Come talk to me. Any of these things, guys, we are not meant to walk through these things alone. We're not. And I know that every person who's here has some, some reason, whether it's just out of a desire to minister, but, but more likely you are struggling with something that we're going to be covering in this class in some capacity. Don't hide Don't hide. There is help and hope and healing and joy to be found through the truth of God's word being applied to your life in a real way. Not just reading a verse and walking away, but reading a verse and soaking in the goodness of God. And through the use of scripture, through the use of helpful resources and prayer, there can be so much healing. So much. And we want to help you. We want to help you. Pray with me. Father God, we, we know that you are the God of, of all comforts, of all joy and all peace. And so God, for, for each person here, whether we are in the season of, of struggle and darkness ourselves or, or whether we know someone who is God, we ask that, that you would be doing a work that we cannot do. God, bring comfort where we are unaware that comfort's needed. God, bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. And God, I pray that you would be leading people to take a step out in faith, to engage in biblical friendship, community, and loving one another in a way that that will help each person to grow, to look more like Jesus, even through their trial, difficulty, and suffering. We pray this in your holy and your precious name. Amen.